the longest game of tournament chess occurred 30 years ago. In this game, we saw 269 moves, and it lasted for 20 hours and 15 minutes. These days, many commentators are comparing or describing the US-China trade discussion as this long game of chess. Who's going to make the next move? Who's eventually going to call checkmate? Who will indeed win? Well, the fact is there are probably no real winners when it comes to the relationship and the changing relationship between the US and China. And even if we do see a short-term resolution when it comes to the tariffs discussion, the fact is that the relationship between these two economies has become a lot less cooperative and far more confrontational and very, very competitive. If you think about it, take Apple and Huawei. Now, most of the sales come from their domestic markets, but what about the rest of the world here in Australia, across Africa, across Asia, across Latin America? So these companies are competing for global market share. Essentially, think of it as Make America Great Again versus the Made in China 2025 strategy. And the 2025 strategy essentially is Beijing encouraging manufacturers to climb up the value chain across China, across a number of sectors. So what are companies telling us in regards to this new norm? Because the inconvenient investment truth is that at periods over the next five years, even if the Democrats win next year, you're going to see periods of volatility as a result of this toing and froing or the rhetoric between China and the US. Well, companies have quite literally been telling us, you know what, we might have the cash sitting on our balance sheet to reinvest, but we're not quite sure this is the right time. We don't know if President Trump will start tweeting about us or our industry. So the CapEx cycle in China certainly hasn't picked up. Many companies, in terms of multinationals, are diversifying away from China. But the key catalyst isn't just because of these trade tensions. Because of higher incomes in China, you've started to see this diversification away from the country. So beneficiaries have been places across ASEAN, such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand. But we can't forget about the enormous supply chain that China has indeed created over the past several decades. When we go to Vietnam and the ports, they're at capacity, bottlenecks. Malaysia's now starting to see the same kind of constraints. 50% of the PC market made in China. 40% of the handset market made in China. So even if companies are diversifying, again, it's costing them, and they're having to pass these costs onto end consumers, as well as you do have these capacity constraints. Along with the Made in China 2025 strategy and companies in China talk about it all the time to us because they can receive subsidies if they show that they're participating in this, in this sort of plan. But another key policy is the Belt Road Initiative. So essentially this is China's way of increasing their soft power status by basically doing all the funding for the infrastructure around the world. I thought this chart was really, really interesting though because whilst countries are, are happy to take Chinese capital, they're still questioning the soft power status of China. So this Pew survey just looks at 25 countries, and even though we have seen support from 2016 to 2018 fall in the US, in terms of 75% support for the US to 30 because of the current administration, 63% of the countries would still prefer to see the US as the key market or global leader. So China still has to work on that soft power status and the trust people have for them. Anthony showed some performance in terms of returns, EM versus DM. This shouldn't really take us by surprise in terms of global portfolios and being underweight to the extent many of them are naked, EM, Asia, and in particular China. So it's the trade tensions, it's slowing growth across Asia, plus again that trust, the opaqueness that many foreigners believe they have when it comes to Chinese corporate data as well as official data. So given that, that people are still underweight Asia and China, those that do have an exposure, what are they exposed to? A really interesting dynamic has occurred in terms of a market observation 
over the past couple of years. And I've tried to highlight it through this chart. So Jingning, who is our China portfolio manager, she's a value contrarian investor, so very different from her peer group, very different from our other fund managers at Fidelity, generally speaking. And she tracks essentially these crowded trade names. She calls them her teddy bears. And her teddy bear index is called this because they're names that we like to hug for security and comfort in periods of uncertainty, hence the reference to teddy bears. So what we've done here is we've taken 300 plus China names and tracked them and ranked them into decile groups, 2017, 2018, and then year to date at the end of September. And those names which have been your top alpha generators have outperformed the bottom names by 15%. So this crowded trade has been really, really extreme. It's been in names like Ping An, which is a financial services, well-known insurance company, Kui Chao Mao Tai, which Anthony has done incredibly well out of, AIA, you could argue Tencent, Alibaba, some of the online education names. So if you have not been exposed to these names, because maybe you're small cap orientated, value contrarian, you have definitely, up until recently, because of the mean reversion, underperformed. Another market observation this year, because of softer sentiment, has been the IPO market. So many blockbuster expected IPOs have been delayed. You can see here year to date, 21 billion US dollars versus this time a year ago of 28 billion. However, most of the IPOs are still Hong Kong China centric, so 67%. The biggest IPO this year is Budweiser, so they listed to the secondary listing. It's quite an interesting story because when they initially came out, they pulled the IPO because of a lack of interest and then came to market in September. And very, very topical and following on from Varal's point about sustainable investing and referring to the issue that many investors have about the sustainable aspect, the ESG aspect of investing in Asia, it's become very, very prominent. So I've just shown here the rankings in terms of governance standards. You can see Australia, not surprisingly, in the region, number one. Hong Kong, Singapore, more developed markets at two and three, although we are concerned about the dual class share registry listing that these two markets are adopting. Korea. I don't know whether many of you follow the South Korean market, but the Chable, so the big companies like Kia and Hyundai. President Moon has done it again, like his other successors, or predecessors, I should say. You know, this time is different, definitely the four most expensive words when it comes to South Korea. We are still seeing the Chables not rewarding minority shareholders in terms of paying out dividends. So still very concerned about that market. And India at number seven. We have seen some positive reforms, both from a capital markets perspective as well as a macro perspective. Whilst growth is slowing, it's still robust. But if Prime Minister Modi really wants to go from a $2.7 trillion economy to a $5 trillion US dollar economy by 2024, he really needs to implement further reforms. We've seen a tax cut in terms of corporate, might see a personal income tax cut, we do need to definitely see agricultural reforms. And what, what is key is this. In the video, our colleague Meta mentioned the demographics and the young population. But the negative side of this story is the fact that Modi needs to create one million jobs a month for this part of the demographic profile. And many of those young people are unskilled. So as China rejects low-end FDI, because again, 2025, climbing up the value chain, India could really benefit if it puts in proper reforms to attract that FDI. China, so again, looking at corporate governance. I mentioned Korea, and as you can see in the yellow part of this chart, what we haven't seen in Korea, we have seen rapid improvements in China over the past two years. Now under the best practices, corporate governance guidelines, every company needs to have a dividend policy. And if your dividend policy becomes less attractive, then these companies have to go up to the regulators and explain exactly why. 
A lot of people ask us about this regulation that was put in place more recently about the party committee member. So essentially on top of every board of the state-owned enterprises, the SOEs, sits a Communist Party member. <coughs> now the fact of the matter was this seems a little bit daunting for foreign investors. It's been in place for a long, long time. But at least now the regulators are being transparent about the position of this party committee member. Now a key theme across China, which is a multi-decade theme that is going to continue, despite slowing retail sales last year, is the power of the Chinese consumer. Now, Xi Jinping has made no secret of the fact that, one, China is going to become the superpower again, and two, GDP is going to be supported by consumption and also services. But what are Chinese consumers buying and what are the trends? These two comparisons are over a one-year period. And you can see the 10 most popular brands. In 2017, two names were Chinese, Alibaba's Alipay and Tencent's WeChat, which is essentially like WhatsApp. I don't know whether you have it on your phones here, but it's more than just a communications app. You can download so much on it, you can do a search through it, etc. But 2018, there are seven names. The downside of these more popular Chinese names coming to market is that the competitive intensity is enormous. And everyone's now going into each other's spaces. So Meituan, number eight, they started off life as an online food company, and then they started moving into the low-end online hotel space, which was dominated by C-Trip. So companies really, really have to have solid strategies in place, almost be first movers, or own the ecosystem such as Tencent and Ali to continue to provide consistency of earnings. Chinese companies have become more popular. More recently, you could argue, because of the whole US-China relationship eroding, but also because of the Chinese companies really understanding their consumption base or their consumer base. Anthony mentioned Li Ning. For those of you who aren't familiar with Li Ning, he's an actual individual. He founded the company. And he's very well known in China because he won a lot of gold medals in the 84 LA Games. He's also the gentleman that ran across the ceiling during the 08 Games and lit the cauldron or the bird's nest. And the name was doing very, very well up until 08 or 09. The problem that Leaning faced is, is that it had just huge inventory levels because of the Games. And so Leaning and another Chinese sports company, Anta, A-N-T-A, were unloved for many, many years because of this inventory issue. At the same time, 40% of the sports apparel market was made up by Adidas and Nike. So these Chinese names were viewed as low quality, don't want to go near them, I'd much rather save my money and spend and buy an Adidas pair of shoes, etc. This was a classic turnaround story though, because Leaning Management decided about two years ago to introduce a new brand called China Leaning. You can only buy China Leaning in China. And as you can see from these pictures of these models on the runway, what they did is they hired top quality designers, used really good quality uh, materials, showed the China Leaning styles on the runways of New York and Paris that was written up in Vogue, and the margins are a lot higher than the broad-based Leaning. So the share price chart shows really contributed to returns. Back to the competitive intensity though. Are you familiar with the acronym BAT? So the US has FANG, we have BAT. But I've crossed out Baidu because again, from a corporate governance perspective, we were always very concerned that the company was over monetizing their search platform and not paying attention to other areas that Alibaba and Tencent were moving into. For example, online payments, cloud, etc. So we actually think that the BAT acronym will remain in place that Baidu will be replaced by ByteDance. ByteDance is one such name that was supposed to come to market in terms of the IPO. Now, ByteDance owns TikTok, which is that short-term video streaming. Um, international, they've got their own domestic equivalent of TikTok, plus their own news, um, so <coughs> news feed. They have a news feed in China. So again, how quickly such a strong name like Baidu can be taken out by ByteDance. <coughs> 
Another key area of innovation when we look at support from the government is healthcare. You can see here how they underspend in terms of GDP, even less than Brazil. And on the right-hand side chart, you can also see in terms of drug launches, blockbuster treatments that you have access to here in Australia, you could barely access them in China. So all these multinationals had to begin their clinical trials from phase one in China, even if they were commercializing their treatments and drugs around the world. So when we look at the healthcare sector and back to active management in a market like China, at one of the end of the spectrum, you have the pharmaceutical generic players who are actually seeing compressed margins because of policy direction. So Beijing has come out and said, OK, we are going to do a tender, a pricing tender. They did this in the fourth quarter last year in 11 cities, 25 drugs. They're going nationwide next year. So essentially, let's say diabetes medication in Beijing. All the drug companies had to put in a price because they could only sell one. So companies last year were slashing their prices by up to 90, 95%, so they could be the only supplier. And it's great for Chinese society because of access to treatment, not great for the generic pharma guys. At the other end of the spectrum, though, the biotech companies are seeing massive amounts of support from the government. One of the big multinational MDs in China told us that Xi Jinping wants a Nobel Peace, uh, not Nobel Peace Prize, a Nobel Prize in this biotech space. So they're wanting to compete against the Europeans, the American companies, in terms of, in particular, oncology treatments. I do encourage you to try and access this movie because, for me, it really highlights the healthcare situation in China. It's based on a true story. It's called Dying to Survive. And essentially, the character in the middle, the protagonist, he's a bit dodgy, a bit shady, you know, has a lot of debt. And the gentleman with the surgical mask around his chin comes into his shop and says, look, I hear you import a lot of Indian products. Can you start importing this generic cancer treatment for me? Because I can't afford the Swiss real version. He reluctantly does so. And then he obviously changes into a really great guy because he realizes that so many people don't have access to this treatment. It's based on a true story. It was a blockbuster hit in China. Everyone in China started tweeting about it or on their equivalent of Twitter, which is Weibo to the point where the Premier even joined in the conversation, really encouraging the regulators to speed up reforms when it comes to the healthcare segment. But it's not just all about innovation and new economy names in China. This chart, whilst it's very contrary in this view, shows that the old China names are really seeing an improvement in terms of the dividend yield and the free cash flow. The reason being is they're being told to. So I refer back to the Korean chables and what the Chinese have been doing. The state-owned enterprises have been encouraged or told to increase the payout ratio, to focus on the total return strategy income, not just capital appreciation. So why am I talking about this? Well, it's contrarian because no one really thinks of China from an income perspective. It's all about the growth story, the consumer story, the innovation story. But this is going to be important because as you see further urbanization, incomes grow, you're going to probably see that savings rate come down from 37%, but it's only going to come down if people in China have security in terms of healthcare as well as pension. So let's say the aim in China is to introduce like a superannuation scheme. Liability for companies to pay out their employees, but where does all this capital go? Because the asset allocation for households at the moment is very limited. You put your money in the bank, you can't really do investment from a property perspective because Xi Jinping keeps on saying, your property is where you live. It's not there for speculative investing. So therefore, you start diversifying into asset classes like fixed income and equities. Historically, mainland Chinese investors have been very momentum driven, very short term. So if you can change how they think about equities, be more like Australians. You know, Australians crave that income side of the story. Then it's good, not just for domestic investors, but better even for foreign investors because of the opportunity set and better run companies, better corporate governance. I started off with a reference to chess, so too I'm going to end with one. 
And for me, this quote, I'm paraphrasing it, really resonated because it makes a lot of sense in terms of how we look at Chinese companies, how we should look at Chinese policy implemented by Beijing. And it was something Joe Tsai, who is the executive vice chairman, the co-founder of Alibaba, said once. And it goes something along the lines of, to the outside observer, when we put the pieces on the chessboard, they might not understand why certain pieces are being put in certain places. But we understand. Make no mistake, we ourselves are very, very clear about the overarching master plan. Thank you. With the Labour Fidelity, the active stock selection in China makes a lot of sense. It is a very large market in terms of the mainland listed companies with over 5,000 names investors can tap into. Lenovo is an example of a company that benefits from the rise in consumption story. Lenovo is also another classic example of Chinese brands which are building global recognition. Lenovo was founded in 1984 in a 20 square metre one room building and it's grown to be one of the leading global tech companies. They first started in PCs in 1990 and now for about seven years quickly became the number one brand in China riding on the growing incomes of the consumer class. For a company like Lenovo, we conduct extensive and continuous fundamental research on the, on the company. Uh, key to that is meeting with management, uh, which we meet regularly. We can also conduct on the ground research such as coming to this computer centre in Hong Kong to see how Lenovo and the competitors' products are selling. I first started getting interested in Lenovo around early 2018. The stock had declined about 75% from its peak in 2015 and was now starting to offer some value. So that fit, fit well with Jing's value-based investment philosophy. 2014, they, at the peak of their cycle, uh, as the number one market share leader in the PC market, they made a very expensive acquisition. And the acquisition brought the company into losses and the, the stock down 60% in a matter of three years. And as you know, I always love the good company in bad time kind of story. So it's, Lenovo started to look very interesting to me because valuation is very compelling. Lenovo is the number one market leader in the PC market, which is still growing. And every year they invested in a lot of R&D projects, including they invested a lot of new projects in the upcoming 5G area. As you know, Chinese consumers are very excited about upcoming 5G. There will be a lot of very interesting consumer applications that will happen in the next 12 to 24 months. We started position of Lenovo in the, around September 2017. Since then, the stock has to return 40% of the return to the portfolio, versus in the meantime, the index has generated negative 9% of the return. Lenovo is an example of a company that's benefiting from some of these key structural themes in China. So whilst there is a lot of choice, investors also have to be mindful about ensuring that the companies that we invest in or they're exposed to really have that earning certainty and play into some of those key themes, whether it's consumption story or Chinese companies climbing up the value chain.